where we left off. If I get clicked back in here, where was that? It was way back at the beginning. Let's start over. Um, we were on this slide right here, and we were talking about who, um, who is the Lord's Supper for, and the way that we were working to answer the question was um, we worked from the angle of who should not be given the sacrament. And, um, and so I shared with you kind of right at the end um, this piece right here, which comes right out of, if I back up a slide, um, this is the last piece from our catechism. We were looking at those who were unforgiving. We talked about some of that. But then uh, at the end of this, what I wrote uh, came out of the Augsburg Confession, Article 24. And we kind of rushed through this. But I want to spend just a minute with you guys on this. Um, it says at the end of the catechism, in all these instances, pastors are stewards of the mysteries of God. And it quotes from 1 Corinthians 4.1. Uh, just a quick um, catechism review for you guys. Who can baptize? Anyone, but who should baptize? The pastor should baptize. In the case of an emergency, you can do an emergency baptism, right? But in the good and right proper order, a pastor should do so because Augsburg Confession, Article 14, we confess that no one should publicly preach or administer the sacraments unless rightly called, is the word. The Latin is rite vocatus. That means their vocation is that their job is to do this, that they've been publicly called as the servant of God to do this. The same thing holds for the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. But unlike baptism, where anyone can baptize, we would say not anyone, not just anyone, can administer the Lord's Supper. That's another angle that we're looking at right here, and that I want to, it's, it's inherent in this piece, but it wasn't the main thrust of what's there in the catechism. But I, I wanted to deal with, the, uh, with you guys for just a second. So, um, in all these instances, pastors are, quote, stewards of the mysteries of God. That's 1 Corinthians 4.1. Um, there are several men in the room who come to the Thursday Bible study where we spent uh, months and months and months working on the book of 1 Corinthians. And um, one thing that I shared with them, and I'll share with the wider group here, is that the book of 1 Corinthians is used um, in two ways. It's used descriptively. So when we look at what's going on in, in the time at Corinth, when Paul writes a letter to the church in Corinth, you got to remember a little bit about what's happened. Paul's gone out on his missionary journeys and he's set up a church as a part of his missionary travels. There's a church in Corinth, and he leaves Corinth after getting the church up and going, and he leaves people in charge of things. And now while he's away, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, what you find is Paul says, you know, I hear there are from Chloe's people, she's come and visited me, it must be a member of the church, a seller of purple goods is what we know about Chloe, so she was probably a woman of of means, not, not ill-gotten means either. Um, but she was a seller, a, a, and Paul would have known her because he was a tent maker, so she dealt with fabric and things like that. So Paul may have known her through his work, his vocation, but also through the church. Chloe's people report back to Paul that there's problems going on. There's divisions in the church. Some say, I follow Paul. Some say, I follow Apollo. Some say, I follow Cephas, which is another word for Peter. Some say, I follow Christ. And there's all kinds of division that's going on in the church in Corinth, which is the cause for Paul to write this letter, which is 1 Corinthians. Then he writes a second letter, and there's even a third letter that we've never found that gets referenced in 1 Corinthians, towards the close of 1 Corinthians. That's one that's never been discovered and therefore is not a part of our scriptures. So back to the cause of it, Paul is writing a letter to people to correct behaviors that are going on in the church, actions that are going on that are divisive and wrong. So the letter, we would say, is both descriptive in that we understand the problem. Paul describes the problem. It's descriptive, but it is also prescriptive. What do I mean by that? 
Sorry? Yeah, here's what you got to do to change. So when the doctor writes your prescription, he's giving you a prescription so that he can fix whatever's ailing you, right? So the book is not simply descriptive of this is what's going on. It is also for the church. And think about the cause of the letter. He wrote the letter to correct abuses and behaviors that were false and not in accordance with the teaching that he left with them. So he writes a letter and he says, this is the way that it should be. And in it, he spends a couple of chapters at the beginning trying to just get to the root of what the problem is with each of them following a different leader. Oh, well, I like this guy, or I like that guy, or I like the other guy. Uh, I've seen this in my previous setting. In the town that we were in, there was another church um, who had, uh, it was a big church, had multiple pastors that were serving. (coughs) Excuse me. It was an evangelical free church. And if you, um, if you look up anything about an evangelical free church, I don't believe we have one here in town, but they were uh, prevalent where I came here from. Um, under efca.org, um, that's their loose affiliation. Like we're synodically affiliated with the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, so lcms.org. They had a website, efca.org, that if you go into their page, it's called, you know, you see a lot of times, what do we believe? So just like on our synodical page, lcms.org, you can go look at what do we believe? Well, similarly, if you go um, to efca.org, I'm not sure if that's still the website, but I'm, I'm betting that it probably is because I don't know why they would change that. You can look at a thing that talks about what they believe. They call it their distinctives, as I recall. And as you go down the points in their distinctives, one of their distinctive points of doctrine is they don't argue fine points of doctrine. Right? So in other words, we're not going to battle over this doctrine or that doctrine. Well, this church had multiple pastors. <clears throat> and with regard to the teaching on, um, on millennialism and dispensationalism, all three of the pastors knew their scriptures very well. But all three of the pastors held differing beliefs with regard to millennialism and dispensationalism. So what happened is they had members of their churches that would follow one pastor or another pastor or another pastor because this guy agrees with what I think. This guy agrees with what I think. This guy agrees with what I think. And if you read 1 Corinthians, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, Paul expressly argues against that. For three chapters, he argues against that. And he says, this isn't how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to grow up into the head. We're all parts of a body. We're all supposed to grow up into the head who is Christ. Okay? Which, by the way, this morning's epistle lesson from 1 Corinthians 6 um, talks about the body. And it talks about how your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes so far as to say, would you unite your body with a prostitute? No, you wouldn't, because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You should be holy, as you've been called to be. So he spends a lot of time talking about the body, the physical body, But in chapter 4, and this is my whole point of even bringing all this stuff out to you, in chapter 4, after about three chapters of arguing both descriptively but also, I'm telling you, prescriptively, Paul says this is how it should be. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says this is how you should regard us. That is, those of us who have set up the church and served amongst you as your shepherds. You with me on that point? This is how one should regard us, as stewards of the mysteries of God. Let's dissect the sentence. What does it mean to be a steward of something? You're a servant. You don't own it. So if I'm a wine steward, I don't own the $350 bottle that I'm bringing to your table. How many of you guys order a $350 bottle of wine? I don't own the bottle. It's just my job to be the caretaker of it. So part of the job of a wine steward, a sommelier, is to maintain the wine collection of a restaurant that's serving it, maybe turn the bottles, flip them, do the things that need to happen to keep the sediment from gathering and do all the things, then come out and serve it properly. But I don't own it. My job is just as the caretaker of it. Okay? I'm a servant. I'm a steward of it. I'm a caretaker of it. Of the mysteries of God. Let's talk about the mysteries of God for just a minute. Is everything about God, you know, perfectly uh, 
Is it in perfect perspicuity? You guys understand everything? Yeah. Paul talks about the mysteries a lot. When we did the, when we did the Bible study with the men's group on Thursdays, um, in uh, Ephesians 5, Paul talks about the mystery of marriage. And there's a, yeah, yeah. Do we need to talk, you guys? After work. Make a, I'll schedule an appointment for tomorrow when the church is closed. <laughs> yeah, marriage is a mystery. But Paul demystifies the mystery, pulls the cover back, and he says, guess what? You know, husbands, you know, uh, wives should submit to their husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of his bride, the church. Oh, and then the women go, uh-uh. Oh, no, you didn't say that. And then Paul turns his attention to the men, and he says, um, he says, husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved his bride, the church, and gave himself up for her. Right? You should be self-sacrificing, husbands. You're the ones in charge, and it's no fun to be in charge because you guys all know, just like I know, that when you're in charge, the stuff doesn't roll downhill. John's cakes don't roll downhill. <laughs> John's cakes roll uphill, right? It rolls uphill until you get to the guy in charge. That's why people don't go in and they say, give me the lowest person on the, on the ladder here. No, they go, I want the manager when they got a problem. Because first rule of management is everything is your problem. Everything is your fault. So Paul in Ephesians 5 says, husbands, you're the head of the wives. And as husbands who've had to act in that role know, that doesn't mean you get to dominate over your wife and rule over her and tell her how everything's going to be. That means you take into account everything that she has to say. You take into her account her emotions, her needs, and you might be even willing to self-sacrifice. Might? No, the scriptures say you should be willing to self-sacrifice for her. Right? All the women are going, see, I see some of that going on. And my wife is waiting till I get home to tell me. <laughs> and then at the end, in Ephesians 5.32, Paul says this, I tell you a mystery, that I'm not talking about the man and the woman. I'm talking about Christ and his bride, the church. That the mystery of marriage, that the properly understood, properly exercised mystery of marriage includes several things. It includes the, the wife's submission to her head of her household, who's her husband. And that's a good place to be, to be cared for, to be nurtured and to be looked after, protected, you know. And the husband, his job is to be that protector, that provider, that caregiver, to the point that he's willing to self-sacrifice, right? That's why the husband gets out of bed at night and checks out what the bang in the night was, as opposed to... And, Guess what else is going to happen? You know, there's going to be what's good about marriage. This comes right out of the sermon from out there, which I know isn't the case for everybody, as I openly said during the sermon. Um, you know, there should be fruitful and be multiply stuff going on in the marriage. It should give others. It should give rise to more. Oh, guess what? So now if you've got a marriage going on and it's to reflect the church, what should the church be doing? Christ is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. And what's happening is proliferation. The church should be building up in love. More should be created as a result of this connection and relationship. And here's the mystery of marriage. When people look at your marriage, this is why God gave you the gift of it. When people look at your marriage, what they ought to be able to see is a picture, a living, breathing picture or example of Christ and his bride, the church. Paul demystifies that for us. And he says, guess what? We're stewards of the mysteries. Now, how many of you guys knew that about marriage? How many of you knew that about Ephesians 5 before we talked about it today? I see a couple of hands. How many of you had to be taught that, though? Same group. Yeah. You didn't just know it from reading that text. I've read Ephesians how many times in my life as a Christian? And do you know it's taken being a pastor, teaching it, studying it, exegeting the text, reading other Pauline epistles, reading commentary before all of a sudden the light went on for me so that I can teach people about this mystery. I didn't know it. It didn't just come naturally to me. I had to be taught it. Who taught me? Stewards of the mysteries. Other pastors, teachers, professors at seminary, right? This is what I'm getting at with this text from 1 Corinthians 4, that Paul says, listen, 
Don't fight about, don't argue about who's the one in charge and pick a team that just agrees with what you want to agree with. Remember, you're the bride. You're the church, you're the bride. And as the bride, God has appointed a bridegroom. Who's the bridegroom? Christ. And how do you get Christ? He's proclaimed to you because the Word was made flesh and He's preached to you. The Word is proclaimed to you. Who's the one proclaiming the Word to you? Stewards. May not necessarily be me. It could be someone else. But this is where the stewards of the mysteries business comes from. I grabbed my Lutheran agenda. This is a pastoral agenda. This is just a, um, it's the book that leads us when we do different kinds of services. And um, in a section under um, the holy ministry, this is an ordination. This is the rite of ordination. And um, you only get ordained once. So I've been ordained. Uh, you guys were not present for it. Um, but because I was once ordained, I was then, after I was ordained, installed into service at my previous church. When you guys issued a divine call to me here at Redeemer Lutheran, I rescinded my call at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, and I received the call here. I came here, and I was installed amongst you as your servant, the steward of the mysteries to you here in this locale, okay? So you didn't know this, but I thought I'd share this with you, that in this section, there's an opening. There's an opening where we sing a little bit, and then the Lord be with you, and also with you, let us pray. There's a couple of prayers. And then immediately the presiding minister, which is usually the district president, or if in the case of me, we choose somebody to do to lead our ordination service, says, hear what the scriptures say concerning the institution of the office of holy ministry. And a lot of times there'll be a bunch of pastors gathered, and those pastors will all be assigned by the presiding minister one or more of these readings to read at an ordination service. And right there in the middle of them all is this one, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. And then after this happens, then you go through um, a presiding minister's address of the candidate. Your brother in Christ, the Lord grant that you receive and keep these words in your heart that you would be strengthened and encouraged in your labors. And then it goes down through a list of questions. It goes like this. Do you acknowledge the Lord has called you through his church? There's immediate call for those of you who are in church at the first service. I was immediately called into service. So when I went to seminary, you know, I sort of felt like I should go to seminary, but I wasn't sure if I should or not. So I went to my pastor and I asked him, I said, I feel like I should go do this. How can I be sure if I should? And he says, go tell the people of God. Go tell other people of God that are members of this church, people that you go to men's Bible breakfast with on Tuesdays, because it was Tuesday for me back in those days. Talk to your friends, talk to your family. And um, if people go, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, then you should continue pursuing it. But if people go, oh, mm, McReynolds, bad idea. I heard you've made a prank call one time. <laughs> Mine was a little less sanctified than the, um, <clears throat> than the refrigerator running, because I did. <clears throat> <laughs> if people go, you know, McReynolds, bad idea, then maybe you ought to rethink your plans. But if people say and encourage you in that, hey, that's not a bad idea. You should, you should pursue that then continue pursuing it. But you're not called until a church actually issues you the call and then ratifies it through ordination and installation. Okay? So at that part, when I'm going through this, do you acknowledge the Lord has called you through His church into the ministry of word and sacrament? I do. Do you believe and confess the canonical books of the Old and New Testaments to be the inspired word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and practice? Yes, I believe and confess the canonical scriptures to be the inspired word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Do you believe and confess the three ecumenical creeds, namely the Apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian creeds? And if you were at the second service last week, you know that I omitted the Nicene Creed quite by accident. So this week we're doing them both. <laughs> Just kidding. As faithful testimonies to the truth of the Holy Scriptures, do you reject all the errors that they condemn? Yes, and then there's some narrative after that. 
Do you confess the unaltered Augsburg Confession to be a true exposition of Holy Scripture and a correct exhibition of the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church? And do you confess that the apology of the Augsburg Confession, the small and large catechisms of Martin Luther, the Schmalkald Articles, the Treatise on the Power and Primacy of the Pope, and the Formula of Concord, as these are all contained in the Book of Concord, are also in agreement with this one scriptural faith? So why do you think Pastor quotes from the Book of Concord in front of you guys? Like on the screen right here, Augsburg Confession. Yes, I make these confessions my own because they are in accord with the Word of God. Do you promise that you will perform the duties of your office in accordance with these confessions and that all your preaching and teaching and administration of the sacraments will be in conformity with the Scriptures and confessions? Yes, I promise with the help of God. Why did I read that to you? Because that's what I promised to do. So you sort of have assurances on one hand that God puts men into the office of holy ministry to be stewards of the mysteries, but also that yours truly doesn't take it lightly that I made a vow both before God and the congregation when I was ordained that I would practice in accordance with this, right? So, so I've been given to do this and to be a steward over this. And then um, it says, will you faithfully instruct, this is the next one, will you faithfully instruct both young and old in the chief articles of the Christian doctrine? Which I believe the Lord's Supper is one of the chief articles, isn't it? The six chief parts, last time I checked. Um, will you forgive the sins of those who repent? Will you promise never to divulge the sins confessed to you? Will you minister faithfully to the sick and dying? Will you demonstrate to the church a constant and ready ministry centered in the gospel? Will you admonish and encourage people to lively confidence in Christ and holy living? If so, yes, I will with the help of God. Finally, will you honor and adorn the office of holy ministry with a holy life? Will you be diligent in the study of holy scripture and confessions? And will you be constant in prayer for those under your pastoral care? I will with the Lord helping me with the power of his grace and Holy Spirit. And then the, the presiding minister reads from John 20, verses 21 to 23. Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you, res if you res retain the sins of any, they are retained. Then the presiding minister says, Kevin Scott McReynolds, I ordain and consecrate you into the office of holy ministry of the word and sacraments and the one holy Catholic and apostolic church in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That happened without you guys there. I'm just telling you what happened. Okay? And that's when I was ordained into the office of ministry that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 4.1. Paul was an apostle, a minister of the word of Christ, who was setting up churches with the duty of preaching, teaching, correcting and rebuking when it needed to be done. That's what the book is about. Which is why we look to it later in chapter 11 for a correct disposition or exposition of our practice with regard to the Lord's Supper, where Paul, just like he did in Ephesians 5, demystifying marriage for us, Paul will, to a degree, demystify the Lord's Supper to us. And he'll tell us how it should be done. He'll say, just as it was given to us, so also we passed it along to you. That on the night our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread, when he given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples. I'll show you this, we'll get into it in the study. But I didn't want to let this one slide slide by. Because it's important, you could easily read over this business of, in these instances, pastors are the stewards of the mysteries of God which includes a sacred responsibility for the admission of the Lord's Supper. This is right out of our catechisms that I vowed to uphold. This doesn't relieve the pastor of faithful and loving oversight of the Lord's altar, which includes examination of those who would commune. The congregation has a responsibility for upholding faithful communion practices. Did you see that part from last week? We read over it quickly last week. Who has the responsibility for upholding faithful communion practices? The congregation who issued immediate call to the pastor to serve them and be faithful in the execution of his duties. And then they quote from the Augsburg Confession. 
No one is admitted to the sacrament without first being examined. The people are also advised about the dignity and use of the sacrament and how it brings about great consolation to anxious consciences, so that they too would learn to believe God and expect and ask from him all that is good. So I'm sort of the, one last quick thing, and then I got you in, your question here in a second, Jim. So I'm called, so the church, the keys were given to the whole church. I just did this for the men's Bible breakfast on Thursday. If this is the whole church and there's, you know, the whole church is combined in this circle or contained in this circle, and there's men and there's women in the church, right? X, Y, X, that's what my X's and Y's are because your chromosomes, <laughs> right? From amongst the entire church, and this could, this could reflect the whole church with a capital C, but we would also say within the church body of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, for the sake of my example I'm about to use here, is the Lord selects men from amongst the church, and the keys, this is my key right here, the keys were given to the whole church. Okay, In the Roman Catholic Church, the keys can only be exercised by the priesthood. Right? Because Roman Catholicism believes that the keys were given to only the priests who minister to the church. Therefore, why do you have to go to give confession privately to a priest in the Catholic Church before he'll let you have communion? Because the priest alone holds the keys. Right? That's their belief. We believe that's false. We believe the keys. You heard me read it, John 20, verses 21. And 22, the keys were given to the church, the capital C. So the keys were bestowed upon the whole church. So the church has the duty of administering the office of the keys, which is the forgiveness of sins, to everyone who's a part of the church. So the pastor is the public minister selected from amongst the faithful to do the public work of the administration of the keys. And what is the Lord's Supper purpose for? for the forgiveness of sins. Remember the definition of a sacrament? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. What's the definition? Physical element commanded by God for what purpose? Forgiveness of the sins. So the administration of the keys includes baptism and the Lord's Supper, which is why a pastor does it, because the pastor is the public minister given to do this publicly on behalf of the church. Not just anyone should do it, publicly on behalf of the church, only the one who's called and ordained. That's what we're saying in Augsburg Confession, Article 14. But the keys were given to the church. So how do you exercise the keys in your day-to-day -day living? Because you're part of the church. We forgive. You do? Sarah, does he forgive? <laughs> <laughs> we forgive. So... I've tried to instill this language with my kids. You know, like what happens amongst people nowadays, like when somebody wrongs another person and gets called out for it, what do they usually say? They say, I'm sorry. And what does the person say back to them? That's all right. Don't worry about it. No worries. Yeah. Or you run over. Or you run over with your car. <laughs> I guess I guess now we know why Al's a car guy. <laughs> Um, I've tried to instill this language with the kids is um, rather than say, you know, I'm sorry, you know, I did this or I did that, I'm sorry, but to say, I've sinned. You know why people say I'm sorry? Because it's hard to say I've sinned against you in this way or that way. Who wants to say that? And this is why it's so offensive when you talk to people in the world today. They don't want to use that language, I've sinned. And who are you to say that I've sinned? But if you talk in terms of sin and forgiveness, sin and grace, then people are more attuned to having that conversation, right? You guys hear me tell you that you're sinners in church. You heard me tell you this morning that you're both at times victims to sin, but at other times you might be perpetrators, <coughs> the guilty party with regard to sin. You can be both, okay? Because Jesus can save both kinds, right? The Good Friday Jesus is the one who saves guilty sinners who are the perpetrators. The Easter Jesus is the Jesus who saves people who are victims to sin. That's how we portray Jesus. He's portrayed both ways in Scripture. Okay? 
So back to the, to the lecture at hand, um, is to instill in the kids this notion of talking in terms of sin. So they say, you know, here's how I sinned. You know, you told me to do this, Dad, and I know that I, I should be listening to you because God gave me you as my father to look after me, and I should honor my father and my mother. And my response to them should be, I forgive you. Well, we don't always get the kids to sort of speak in terms of, I've sinned this way, but I will tell you that I hear this pretty much on the regular in our house, I forgive you. And that's the, that's the use of the keys in the private life because they're the church. And they should be using that language. And my encouragement to you in your marriages should be that that's how you function in your marriages. So I believe that it probably happens more than just sometimes, right? My, I believe that you've never been run over literally by a car. <laughs> um, my professor at seminary, Bob Kolb, used to say that, you know, the scriptures teach this, do not let the sun go down on your anger, right? So what my professor Bob Kolb used to tell us is he said, at night, when my wife and I crawl into bed, he'd say, we talk about, you know, in what ways have we sinned today? And um, we would confess them openly to each other because we're both part of the church. And then we would absolve one another. That's the use of the keys. Now, I told him on the side, I said, that would never happen in my house because my wife falls asleep on the couch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then comes to bed way later and wakes me up. And then there's reason to forget, you know. No, it doesn't go like that. Now I'll need to ask her forgiveness. Honey, I've sinned by outing you that you fall asleep on the couch. <laughs> Are we cool with this business of a pastor's, the job? I know you had the question. A pastor being the publicly ordained um, steward of the gifts on behalf of the church. And not just anybody should do it, but someone who's called and ordained because that means they've been trained, taught, schooled, in the school of hard knocks sometimes, experienced to do these things. Right, okay, Jim. Right. Yeah. Right. So what Jim's pointing out is he read further in 1 Corinthians 4, and he says what it says there is that there are many mysteries, not all of which I have the promise will be revealed on the last day. The Lord may retain some of those mysteries. But here's the difference on the last day when we're, when we're in the new creation. You know, we talked about this in the, in the death Bible study. What's the last day going to look like? I don't really know. I know what the scriptures describe, and they describe it in apocalyptic literature, which is its own unique genre. We were talking about this beforehand, you and I. Um, and so you have to read it as such, is that it's visionary, and it may not always be a literal understanding, but it at least reveals to us something of the mystery of what's going to happen on that day, which I tried to demystify with you guys, with you guys when we did the death Bible study. And we covered the six parts of, of death and dying, you know, the last day, you know, the day of your death, um, what's the interim state look like? What's the day of the resurrection of all flesh look like? And what's the life everlasting going to look like? Well, I'm going to give you what the scriptures give you, but we recognize during the course of that study that there's some things that are just unanswerable at this side of heaven. Like, will all of the heavens and earth be completely uh, annihilated and God will make them all new again at the calling of his word? Maybe, because you've got a few scriptures that can support that. Or will he just recreate or, or um, enhance the creation that we're already a part of? Maybe. He could do that too. Because both ways it talks about that in the scriptures. Yes? I just want to share. I think I shared this with you once before that this quote just stuck in my head from a long time ago. Somebody in Ottawa was his name. I don't know. But I'm just listening to thought for this kind of thought. A God understood is no God. And... I mean, I don't want to. If I understood God, then I'd be like that. You know, all those mysteries. See, that's the first sin, mm -hmm. is to want to be in the place of God, right? The man and the woman wanted to be like God, knowing good from evil. So, but he's, bigger, he's so much bigger than us. There's no way we can understand it. And that yeah. Makes, you know, I mean, that's a good thing. 
Yes. Yes, very much so. So give me the German on that again. Ein begriffener Gott ist kein Gott. Yeah, so that means a God understood is no God. Um, we read a book in seminary uh, in a systems class called The Domestication of Transcendence, which in the title of the book alone reveals kind of what we were reading about. What does it mean to domesticate something? Tame it. What's transcendence mean? It's above all things. It's not even fully understandable. And what the, the author's key uh, driving point was in the book was that what we've done nowadays is it's almost as if we've confined God to a box and we've said, well, this is how God works and this isn't how God works. And, and his argument was, no, that lesson that I've shared with you before from up front here, God is God and you are not. God is, God is a terrifying God in some respects. So, so think about this with regard to salvation alone, right? Um, we confess, and I don't think a lot of people really fully understand the, the gravity of what it means, the fact that we confess that God alone determines whether or not you will be in heaven or not. So what a lot of churches, false churches, will do is they'll read into the scriptures. And uh, I saw Billy Graham's son on TV making a plea, you know, pray this prayer or whatever. You know, I receive you, Lord, into my heart. It's, some, it's amazing how much he looks like Billy Graham himself. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. But, you know, the point of praying that prayer is because what they're trying to get people to do is ex opere operato, which is a Catholic, which is funny because Baptists reject Catholicism. But in addition to that, they're trying to get you to take some measure of responsibility for receiving the Lord into your heart, to which I have loudly and proudly proclaimed, you can't force God to do anything. Which is frightening to people. Which is why they want to take some control of the transaction when it comes to their salvation. Well, I have to decide for Jesus. Nope, doesn't even matter if you decide for Jesus. God gets the choice. Just because you decided for him doesn't automatically force his hand to open the pearly gates and say, welcome, come on in, because now you decided for me. No. God alone has to decide, all right? Now, that's frightening to people because we know some are damned and some are not. And so then we end up with stuff like single predestination and double predestination. We're back to the teachers at this other church and people find things that make sense to them and they find a pastor that speaks to them that can make it make sense to them. And that's not my job is to find you know, a particular following and go, well, I'm going to get my little cult of personality and everybody can follow me. My job is to be faithful to teaching the scriptures. And some will reject it. And I have to be comfortable with that. And it's because God is God and I am not and you are not and I have to tell you that. So, yeah, Jim. Because, two reasons. Because remember, I've done this thing with you ad nauseum also. So this is the, the unknown, okay? So how do we know if God's going to choose us or not? Well, that's sort of unknown. That's an invisible thing. It's invisible, right? It's unknown. Will God save or won't he save? He'll send some to heaven. He'll some, send some to hell. That's what the scriptures say, right? Whenever we bump up against that unknown, invisible God, that should send us running to the revealed God. And what does God reveal about himself? He says, for God so loved the world. And where does God reveal this about him? He reveals this about himself in his word and in his sacraments. Because what do his sacraments do? His sacraments give the forgiveness of sins, right? What does his word do? It proclaims the forgiveness of sins. What does his word do? His word became flesh and dwelt among us. And why I can tell you that you're saved, Jim, why I can tell anybody in this room that they're saved is because they're here outwardly clinging to the promises that are revealed in the word and sacrament. You're here on a day that's bitterly cold that a lot of people are just staying home desiring the gifts, which is, I made the point in my sermon, why do people come to church? I know not all of you have been to church yet. Why do people want to come to church? Because they want to have God revealed to them. And what does God reveal? His love for them. I sent my son. Why? That's a living, breathing Picture example of my love for you because you're my bride. 
And as my bride, I love you unconditionally. I love you so much that I'd be even willing to die for you. (gasps) Ephesians 5. That's why I can say that you're saved. Now, is it true that I can tell everybody that they're saved? Because that's the job of the church is to go tell the whole world that they're saved, that Jesus died for them. But what's the problem with some people in the world? They don't care. I just talked to the Jennings at the end of church. And they said that their son, who's a confirmand of mine, that the little kids, when they get together for their basketball games, they have a prayer before they play basketball. And he says, is it okay if I'm telling this story? I should have asked. After the game. All right. They have a prayer. And they heard the voice of their son coming from this little prayer group. And they're praying the Lord's Prayer. And they asked him about it. And he said, it's because I'm the only one who knows the prayer. And it's the Lord's Prayer, which usually if you're going to know anything, you're going to know the Lord's Prayer. But this is the day and age that we live in, is that only a few will hear and respond and cling to the call. There will be others who either because of their own fault reject it or because they're a victim. So how many of those little kids on that basketball team have parents that just don't take them to church and they just don't know better because their parents don't take them? See, they're victims. It doesn't mean that Jesus isn't for them. He is for them. But how are they going to know unless someone goes and tells them? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, right? So, I mean, it sort of reemphasizes the need for these stewards, which wasn't my point, but we're there. <laughs> are we good here? We're talking about the Lord's Supper. So I want to I move us into probably an introduction of the next topic it may be as far as we get in the rest of our time. Amongst the stewards of the mysteries of God, who am I talking about? Pastors. Amongst the stewards, with regard to the topic of the Lord's Supper, several years ago, there uh, arose some dissension. In the form of a document called a Declaration of Eucharistic Understanding and Practice. Okay, so let's, dis- let's sort of demystify the words. You see a convention right here, right? That's a LCMS convention, actually, the, the latest one. Should look familiar to you, Dave, since you were there. What does it mean to make a declaration of something? We have a Declaration of Independence. We're just going to declare our independence. Within our synod, those of you guys don't know this, the Concordia University system, Concordia University, Texas Board of Regents declared suddenly that they are no longer under synodical control. So that was something that the convention had to take into business and deal with, and they're still dealing with it. So synod, by the way, sued the Board of Regents of Concordia University, Texas, for the entire value of the university and all of its property and assets. Uh, The lawsuit got filed this year, and it's going to court in February if it stays on track. Because what the Board of Regents did was they said, "Eh." the Synod, when they created the Concordia University system, um, it was always under synodical control, which meant power to um, stand over the schools belonged to the church body at large. So that the church, or so that these schools and institutions of higher learning would always teach in accordance with what we believe with our doctrine. But Texas has just said, you know what? We're going to just declare our independence. We don't want to be under synodical control anymore. Can they do that? Nope. That's why they're getting sued. And a legal under independent legal review says Synod's got a pretty good case. So it should be interesting to see this one play out. That's beside the point. A declaration of Eucharistic understanding. Eucharistic comes from the Greek word oikaristo. Oikaristo is, you guys have heard this like in the Catholic Church, they're going to have the celebration of the service of the Eucharist. A lot of times you'll see it like at a funeral they'll do it. They'll do it in regular worship in the sacrifice of the, ma- in the, sacrifice of the Mass. Eucharistic just means Lord's Supper. So we're going to declare what our understanding regarding the Lord's Supper and practice is. It's doip for short. So if you hear me talk about doip, I'm not talking about what my teenage kids said to me. Doi. 
even though they do talk that way sometimes. I cannot, um, I cannot with certainty establish the dating of this document, the DOIP document. I've done some research on this, um, and I cannot with, as I said, absolute certainty. I think with further research, I could probably locate some stuff, but in some cursory searches online um, and using a CTCR document as a guide, just suffice it to say that this DOIP document does exist, but I just can't, for the purposes of this study, right now establish the date of this document. I did locate it on Daystar Journal's website. Daystar Journal, um, the, the group Daystar, so uh, the best way I can describe this, and this is why I said it's going to take a little time to work through some understanding here. The best way to describe this is think of our American political system. Two-party system, right? We're a democracy. The United States is a democracy. We're a two-party system. And I read an article yesterday that said that in Iowa, after the Iowa caucuses, there's a sense of doom and foreboding. <laughs> but it was sort of an interesting article. You have two parties, which means you only get two candidates. And haven't we ever, all of us heard, why can't we put forward a decent candidate on either party's side any longer? What's up? Same analogy applies to synod, okay? Within the Missouri Synod, we have sects and groups, and Dave can attest to this, because leading into convention, Dave, where elections happened, you received on the regular, once you were registered as a delegate who had voting rights at synod, you started to get inundated in the mail, didn't you? With voting guides by each of the representative groups within our synod. You've got really ultra-conservatives, right? So you've got the ACELC. You've got the um, Brothers of John the Steadfast. You've got um, the uh, Lutheran Clarion. You've got, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people that write on the ultra-conservative end of things within our synod. Then you've got the people who are in the middle, which I don't even know any groups that are, are sort of represented in the middle. That's why I said, I'm always in the middle of stuff, and that's why I look like everybody's enemy. Because if you're on one end of the spectrum or the other end of the spectrum, you look like, to the conservative set, you look like you're ultra-liberal when you're in the middle. And when you're super conservative, you look like you're ultra-liberal because you're in the middle. You're always losing. Okay? But on the other end of the spectrum, on the liberal end of politics within our synod, is Daystar. You tracking with me? Daystar, this is probably not a totally fair characterization, but I bet I'd hit about 80% of the truth on this. Daystar is just a group of people. It comes from the passage, when the daystar rises on your hearts. Uh, it's it's uh, Psalms. I can't think of it right off the top of my head. But it's a group of people, and they have a publication called the Daystar Journal. Um, uh, Oh, I'm going to have a blank on his name right now. Uh, president that preceded Harrison. I should know because he was president when I was at seminary uh, in Synod. He was of the Daystar ilk. He writes for Daystar. And he was, a lib he was from Texas, too. Uh, starts with a G. Gierke? Is it Gierke? I'm thinking that's a Nebraska name. Anyway. Uh, anyway. You've got the far left and you've got the far right, okay? We've got that within our synod. The, this Daystar group is a group of the more liberal-leaning pastors, and they sort of had their inception that dates back to the walkout at seminary and Seminex in the early 70s. And I've talked about that with you guys in here before, right? That when a bunch of the pastors and professors and teachers walked out of our synod and became what's today known as the ELCA, which we would say is very liberal-leaning. Does that make sense why I'm saying this? Yeah, liberal acting. Okay, do you have a question? Or are you just waving at me? <laughs> Some stayed within synod. Some liberal-leaning pastors 
stayed within synod because of the very thing I've shared with you in this room before during the course of this Bible study is you got some who went cooperate and graduate. I'll stay within the synod because inside synod my pension plan is held. If I leave synod, then I put my pension as it stands today at risk. There's one reason why you should stay and just go underground a little bit. Well, I'll just say what I want to say. Because remember, you get, you get uh, reviewed at Synod. You pass your boards, which is theological review, which got reinstated when I was in seminary. So I had to go through theological review. I had to pass muster before they would let me be ordained even. I had to be approved by all the powers that be before I could even get ordained. So a lot of guys... I heard it with my own two ears from friends of mine, cooperate and graduate. And then when you get out there, you can teach and do what you want to do because we're independently constituted. What our synod is, is a collection of churches who have, by their constitutions, vowed to walk in lockstep with one another regarding doctrine. But the facts are, Dave, can you answer this question? We got churches within our synod who are not in lockstep with us. So you had, and university schools, system schools, that are not in lockstep with us. So what you'll have at synod and convention is churches that raise up different resolutions for vote before the entire synod to see if they can get their agenda pushed. So at every synod since the walkout, I guarantee you there has been at least a church or two that has tried to put out as a floor resolution um, pushing for women's ordination. Was there this year? Well, it didn't make it to floor. Yeah, it usually gets killed in committee before it ever makes it to floor business for the synod. Why? Because this is a long-established practice within our synod. Only men in the office of the ministry, right? Yes, ma'am. Well, no, no, because that's more of an individual pastor and his implementation. Um, what she's asking about is, is um, uh, announcing before communion, where that was sort of a more regular thing in years past. It's gotten less regular, partially because, I, you know, I would say the walkout probably had an effect on that, right? And I would say there are still some liberal-leaning pastors that are out there. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm not trying to point fingers or say this is why. I'm giving you, I'm not saying this is the comprehensive list of why there are liberal-leaning pastors. I'm just telling you that Daystar is a group of more liberal-leaning pastors. Um, to give you some of the insight to our synod, they talk about the, um, the saltwater states. Dave's, Dave's acknowledging this. So we're the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. We were founded... You know, in St. Louis, we can trace our, our history and our roots amongst mostly conservative-leaning German theological roots. But as our church has spread towards the two sides, the two coasts in the United States, you got saltwater states, liberal-leaning states. And this is why I'm telling you, just like there's um, American politics that exist out there that lean liberal versus conservative, and it even sort of lines up with where you live in the country, so also it goes in our synod. Believe it, okay? So there are other districts, and I know I'm being recorded right now, but there are other districts that have liberal-leaning tendencies. A lot of them. I will tell you that the, the uh, Mid-South District, which we have President Pavla in the Mid-South District, he's one of three candidates to fill the vacancy of the outgoing... Um, uh, president of Fort Wayne Seminary. He tends only to call conservative-leaning pastors into his district. Uh, back when I was in Nebraska, the Wyoming district uh, was comprised of the whole state of Wyoming and the panhandle of Nebraska. And the retired district president from the Wyoming district president was married to a local in Central City and used to come to my church on holidays when he'd come back to be with his wife's family. And they would not call pastors from St. Louis. They would only call Fort Wayne pastors because they were the more conservative. So when you're in the central part of the United States, in a bit of a V even, 
going up from Texas, you get the most conservative-leaning churches, and then as you move outward, you get less conservative churches, just sort of as a general rule. Do they still have the English district? They still have an English district. Real quick word on the English district. My mom and dad are members of an English district church. We have a non-geographical district within our church. So back in the 40s, you had some uh, German-speaking, Carol, you'd have fit right in, <laughs> German-only speaking churches, because they were German immigrants and sprechen Sie Deutsch? Ambition? Yeah. Yeah. And some churches will still do the German liturgy. Well, in the 40s, guess what happened? Yeah, we had World War II going on. And now if you're speaking German in church, you are a, a suspected to be a kraut. And that's the history of American flags getting moved inside of our chancels in churches. Because if you move the American flag inside the chancel, even if you're speaking German, now you start to look like you're at least patriotic. And then they started speaking English in some of these churches, and they became a non-geographical district within our synod that still exists today. It's silliness, honestly, because in Lincoln, Nebraska, there's one English district church, and the guy can't get together with his district mates, right? So he gets together with the Lincoln Circuit. Anyway, liberal and conservative pastors within the church body, the liberal set writes for the Daystar Journal. In the 1998 convention of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, the convention as a whole asked the CTCR. The CTCR is the Commission on Theology and Church Relations. So in the post-walkout days in the 70s, when most of the faculty and a bunch of pastors walked out of the synod, the synod in convention said, we got to do something so that this doesn't happen again. We need to have, in a sense, like a supreme court that can make rulings on matters of doctrine. So they formed a panel called the CTCR. That's made up of some seminary professors, some commissioned church workers, both men and women, and it's made up of lay delegates. And matters of doctrine get submitted to the CTCR. The CTCR writes a ruling on it and publishes those documents. That's as simple a way as I can put it for you guys. Are you with me on this? So the CTCR was in force, functioning, doing its job. At the 1998 convention, the LCMS asked the CTCR to, quote, in a timely fashion, uh, uh, in, in a timely fashion, make a careful response to DOIP with special emphasis on pastoral oversight in light of 1 Corinthians 4.1 and the role that agreement in the public confession of faith and participation in the Lord's Supper entails. And I have notated that for you in the Synod Convention, 1998 Convention, Resolution 3-05, to reaffirm our practice of admission to the Lord's Supper Convention Proceedings, page 115, it was approved by Synod in convention that we would petition the CTCR to write a document. That's the document we've been studying as elders here at this church, is the response of the CTCR. Now, before I go too much further, um, we're done for today. I'm just setting the palette for you guys so that we can look at what DOIP says. All right? Um, I got two minutes. I'm going to run down their six points. Christ instituted the sacrament of his body and blood to nourish and sustain his people and assure them of his grace. That's point one. St. Paul defines worthy reception of the body and blood in terms of self-examination and discernment of the Lord's body. Our Lutheran confessions, in the words of the small catechism, state clearly that one is truly worthy and well-prepared who has faith in the words of Christ, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins or remission of sins. That's small catechism, part 5, page 10. Our Lutheran confessions, using the words of the large catechism, state clearly that only those should exclude themselves from the sacrament who desire no grace and absolution and have no intention to amend their lives. That's large catechism 5, paragraph 61. A practice congruent with the scripture and confessions calls for the sacrament to be shared with those who repent of their sins, believe the real presence, and sincerely attend to amend their lives. Therefore, 
I've taught you guys this before. Anytime you see the therefore, look at what they're after. We affirm the right of, Lutheran, of the Lutheran congregation and pastors to offer the Eucharist to all who share this biblical and confessional stance. We declare this to be our Eucharistic understanding and practice, and we commend it to others. Anybody see anything wrong with these six points? John says he doesn't see anything wrong with them. Carol, you said you do. The last one, we affirm the right of the congregation and pastors to offer the Eucharist to all who share the biblical and confessional stance. Yeah. See, so they don't, they don't limit it to people who are confessing what they believe by virtue of their membership. So basically what it is, it's it's kind of like where I was at the beginning of the study with you guys. It's a very rudimentary statement that leaves out some important details. We'll, dis we'll dissect it a little further when we get together next time. But this DOIP document basically outlines a very simplistic view towards the Lord's Supper, which leaves some important things out. So we'll come back and, and review it and critique it together, okay? If you want to look it up and you can establish a date, I'll keep working on that too, but... Thank you. You're welcome. No problem. That's good. That's good. <laughs>